If you want to understand how we got here, we need to start here. 2014 appeared to be the bottom of the relationship between Europe and Russia. And yes, I realize how quaint that sounds now. While Ukraine was in the midst of a revolution, Russia took the opportunity to annex Crimea. Europe, after having spent decades building a liberal order, was outraged. Their main response was the imposition of sanctions, which did indeed succeed in dealing significant damage to the Russian economy. However, they barely dented Putin's domestic popularity, which went from 65% in December 2013 to 86% in June 2014. Not too long afterward, Germany looked to refresh the relationship, appearing to be willing to forgive even if not forget. Hey, buying flowers can go a long way with those sorts of things. The Nord Stream 1 pipeline had long been delivering cheap gas to Germany. Planning for a Nord Stream 2 began in 2011, but the annexation of Crimea put it on pause. By 2018, though, the pipeline in the Baltic Sea was full steam ahead, with construction beginning at Germany's terminal. Critics wasted no time laying a verbal smackdown, most prominently from U.S. President Donald Trump. The biggest skeptics compared the New Deal to a more infamous pact between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. But German Chancellor Angela Merkel was undeterred. This was the modern-day version of Ostpolitik, West Germany's successful re-engagement with Eastern Europe under Willy Brandt, which earned him a Nobel Peace Prize. The real reason Washington was upset was because Germany was not installing liquid natural gas terminals, which could open the markets to U.S. exports. And yes, Germany was going to make a lot of money in the process. But the continued relationship with Russia would give Moscow a stake in good European relations. Putin would have to think twice before pulling another Crimea, if it meant that all of Russia's investment in Nord Stream would go up in smoke. Germany would have the leverage to force Putin to sit down in peace talks with his neighbors, to find acceptable solutions to ongoing conflicts. Everything would be fine. Fast forward to February 24th, 2022. Russia invaded Ukraine, and the whole theory aged like milk. In the intervening year, it has become fashionable to look at old videos like this, view the glass as half-empty, and conclude that the policy was ridiculous. But Germany's missteps were more subtle. As such, in this video, we will examine the history of economic interdependence, why it is a broadly sensible policy recommendation, but how it can fail in some circumstances. Oh, and uh, buckle up, because there are going to be some lines on maps. Or at least there will be a lines on maps like substance. And if you stick around to the very end, I promise that we'll talk about Zelensky visiting a McDonald's. But we start with the money. Economic interdependence is one of the oldest theories in international relations. It dates back to Immanuel Kant's publication of Perpetual Peace. If you don't know how long ago that was, that's fine. The images say it all. The basic idea is that states that trade together, stay together. This is straightforward if each has something the other can't make. Say, Russian borscht for customers in Germany, and German sausage customers in Russia. You trade, and everybody wins. If the countries suddenly have a diplomatic fallout, you will have a lot of beet soup fans marching in the streets of Berlin, and a bunch of sausage fans marching in the streets of Moscow. Neither leader likes the sound of that, and so they have strong incentives to work out their differences at the bargaining table. More subtly, this logic still applies if the flow of goods is only going in one way. If Russia sells gas to Germany, Germany uses that gas to run its meat grinders. Those meat grinders produce sausage, and then Germany sells that sausage to other countries for a profit then blowing up that relationship still causes a hit to both sides' bank accounts. And there would be no more sausage. How sad. 
We can be a little more precise with the logic to understand why trade broadly has a peace-inducing effect. The logic is plain to see when you look at some lines on maps, though sadly Germany and Russia do not share a border, and the last time that they did, things did not go so well anyway. And thus instead, I'm going to have to illustrate this with arrows on a generic unidimensional policy space. Sound okay? Or maybe we'll just call it the Neoliberal Order Index. Or just the Freedom Index. Germany wants to max it out. Russia doesn't. In the context of the current conflict, freedom could mean Ukrainian self-determination. Imagine that this red arrow represents the expected amount of Ukrainian self-determination that a conflict would produce. The space between this yellow arrow and the red arrow represents Germany's costs of conflict, weighed according to how much it cares about Ukraine. That includes how much Germany internalizes Ukraine's own preferences for self-determination, as Kyiv is going to be sidelined for the rest of this theoretical exercise. It is the same story for Russia on the other side, between the red and blue lines. Long-time lines-on maps enthusiasts will recognize that this creates a negotiating space that leaves both parties better off than if a conflict started. The lack of a border between Russia and Germany just means that we are dealing with a unidimensional policy space instead of territory, and an economic war instead of a kinetic one. But the negotiating space still exists. The key to economic interdependence is that the set of solutions acceptable to both parties grows as the costs of conflict increase. See? This is the range now. Before, it was in here. The difference, as Kant can't wait to tell you, is the additional economic sacrifice. And indeed, this was the central idea behind Germany's plan. If you let Russia build Nord Stream, you can also shut down Nord Stream. All of those high profit margins that Russia earned per unit of sale suddenly disappear. Anticipating that, and not wanting to lose out on the money, Russia becomes more compliant. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished? The problem with this line of thinking is that we were only looking at one half of the equation. Russia's increased cost. But remember, the trade increases both parties' costs. That means Germany also becomes more compliant. If Russia could somehow control exactly which policy to propose, it can now convince Germany to accept a division all the way down here, which is a lower value on the Freedom Index than was possible before. To be clear, Germany is no worse off under such circumstances, despite Russia's coercion. Its loss on the line is exactly offset by its gains from trade. Ukraine might not be exactly happy about this, the rest of the Western Alliance might not be happy about this, but it is Germany's decision, and Germany might be okay imposing that externality on everyone else. And to be fair to Germany, the opposite is true as well. If Germany issues the demands, before only this level of freedom was possible, now it is here. With that, we finally arrive at the key question, which effect dominates? Answering that first requires recognizing that international bargaining is not always the frictionless vacuum of a one-dimensional policy space. We have discussed all sorts of bargaining problems here before, but the one that I want to focus on is how resolved states are. That is, how much they care about the abstract issues, like freedom versus money and human life. One of the reasons that I'm doing this will become clear in a moment. The other reason is because such uncertainty appeared to be at work on the eve of war. You may recall that Russian intelligence was gambling that Western powers did not care much about the fate of Ukraine. At a high level, Russian intelligence knew that the West preferred that the Kremlin stay out of Ukrainian business. But if forced to choose between defending Ukraine and getting cheap gas, they would pick the latter. How does this work in the abstract unidimensional policy space from before? Well, Russia did not know whether Germany's true limit line was here, 
meaning they cared more about Ukraine, or that Berlin was more sensitive about gas, and so it would be more permissive of Russian demands. Given the two uncertain possibilities, Russia may have preferred to attempt to implement the more aggressive policy, even though Germany would have pushed back with sanctions if Berlin were truly resolved, and Russia could have achieved a better outcome by making a more conciliatory demand instead. Those are the intuitive parts of this logic. Many of you understood some of these basic principles before watching this video, either because you have watched similar videos before on this subject, or because you spend enough time at the poker table to appreciate risk-return trade-offs. But there are two less obvious pieces of the puzzle that jeopardized the success of Germany's integration policy. First, what determines whether Russia prefers trying to implement the risky policy or stick to the safe policy is the difference between the two possible limit lines. We call this a peace premium, because it is how much extra Russia has to concede to Germany to guarantee the peace if Germany is truly resolved. What is critical is that as the difference increases, Russia becomes more inclined to take risks. The reason is obvious when looking at the opposite case, when the difference between the two is fleeting. Is it worth trying to take this tiny sliver more when doing so risks a war? Except for under extreme circumstances, the answer is no. In contrast, taking a risk sounds more appealing when the implicit price you pay for peace is large. Simply forking over this large of an unnecessary concession does not sound like a good idea. The second weird aspect of this is how larger economic costs of war interact with all of this. Back in 2019, a YouTube AI was still pretending to be a credible academic and answered that question. It turns out that we can't all just get along. Economic interdependence can be really bad for peace in this case. The Russian incentive to make aggressive demands outweighs its own higher cost. If the initial cost of conflict skews more toward Russia, and the new benefits of trade skew more toward Germany. I will spare you the mathematical proof, but the basic idea is that high initial Russian costs would have originally incentivized small demands, and that disproportionate German gains from trade exacerbate the central problem that this video has highlighted. Are these two conditions true here? The jury is still out on that one. We are observing the effects of the lost trade now, with Germany building liquid natural gas terminals, and Russia finding other markets for its energy exports. But the fact that Germany initially responded to the invasion by binge-buying Russian natural gas to fill its storage units before Russia started cutting off Nord Stream purchases is telling. Solving the mystery of the Nord Stream sabotage might help there too, but that has been a struggle. Now, I cannot recommend binge-buying Russian energy, nor can I recommend that you personally blow up a pipeline, but I can recommend blowing your mind by binge-reading my book on the causes of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Check the video description for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. A couple of weeks ago, I had predictive text try to write a sign-off. Some of you posted yours in the comments. They were predictably silly, like this one that thinks I am a member of the National Association of Realtors, or this one about Zelensky being the first Russian president of Russia, or this one tying him to a McDonald's. That actually reminded me of a campaign film of Zelensky ordering from a drive through the person taking his order asked him if he wanted pie, and this was his genuine reaction, creating a bit of a meme in Ukrainian culture. But what got me the most is that sometimes I was unsure whether people were doing the bit, or the comments were coming from run-of-the-mill disinformation campaigns. Like this one. Can you confidently say that someone was punching in predictive text, and this wasn't simply nonsense from a nonsense troll farm?